Good morning, everyone. If I could just get you to take your seats, we can get started. My name is Pauline Jones. I'm the director of the International Institute. The African Studies Center is one of our many uh, centers within the International Institute. I'm also a professor of political science. And I am very delighted, um, really excited, actually, to be here today to welcome you um, and to uh, launch um, the, what's going to be a very exciting day. And I have to say that what makes me most excited about being here and about welcoming you to this sy symposium is not just celebrating what's been achieved over the past 10 years, which is truly extraordinary, truly extraordinary, uh, but also embracing the challenges and opportunities ahead. I think that is what's most exciting about uh, this weekend and about the future. There is so much uh, more to be accomplished, and we have the capacity, uh, thanks to the support of the university, thanks to the excellent leadership that the ASC has had and will continue to have, we, we have the capacity to continue to achieve, uh, continue to, to embrace these challenges and these opportunities. So this is very exciting. Um, I also have the pleasure this morning of introducing our university president, Dr. Mark Slissel. And I'm going to confess that I really, sometimes, uh, it's a tongue twister, your name. <laughs> so every once in a while, I call you Dr. Seuss. But I won't do that this morning. I won't go on record. Was that, was that, did I say that out loud? <laughs> Dr. Mark Slissel is the 14th president of the University of Michigan and the first physician scientist to lead the institution. He became president in July 2014. Previously, President Slissel was provost of Brown University where he was responsible for all academic programmatic and budgetary functions within Brown's schools and colleges, as well as the libraries, research institutes, and centers. Prior to his appointment as, provost, <clears throat> as Brown's provost in 2011, he was UC Berkeley's Dean of Biological Sciences in the College of Letters and Sciences and held the C.H. Lee Chair in Biochemistry. A graduate of Princeton University, President Slissel, earned both MD and PhD degrees at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. He did his residency training in internal medicine at Hopkins Hospital and conducted postdoctoral research as a Bristol Myers Cancel Research Fellow under David Baltimore at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology's Whitehead Institute. President Slissel began his career as a faculty member at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine in 1991, where he earned a number of awards and fellowships for his research and teaching. President Slissel was elected to the American Society of, Civil, of, excuse me, of Clinical Investigators in 1998 and the American Association of Physicians in 2013. He has been a member of the American Association of Immunologists since 1992 and was named a Fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science in 2013. Most importantly, President Slissel, like his, pre his predecessor, Mary Sue Coleman, has been an active supporter, an active and ardent supporter, I would say, of the African Studies Center and its collaborative engagements with institutions of higher learning across Africa. So thank you, Dr. Sussel. Well, I'm just going to say thank you, Professor Jones, and leave it at, <laughs> leave it at that and let my resume be compared with Dr. Seuss. <laughs> so thanks for the introduction and congratulations really to all of the faculty, the staff, and the students who've made the African Studies Center such an outstanding and important success for the University of Michigan. Uh, it's really an honor to be here as we celebrate a decade of tremendous achievement of the African Studies Center. I'd also like to thank uh, or express my appreciation to our friends and fellow educators and researchers from Africa uh, who are here joining us uh, today and for this symposium. Uh, at the University of Michigan, we take great pride in being an international community of scholars. With students and faculty members here from all around the world who contribute culturally and intellectually to our diverse academic community. 20% of the current Michigan faculty were born outside the United States. We simply would not be a comprehensive university without our African scholars. Our historians believe that the U of M's first African student, native African student, joined our campus in 1884. His name was John Mavuma Numbala, and he was from Natal. 
Today, we're immensely proud that students from nearly 20 African countries study with us here in Ann Arbor. I hope that students from Africa will always feel welcome here and that they'll have the opportunity to pursue their dreams at the University of Michigan. For 10 years, the African Studies Center has been an important driver of the University of Michigan's academic excellence. The center's work to foster research, student engagement, and partnerships that address some of the most pressing societal challenges represents the very essence of the U of M's approach for international collaboration. Thanks to all of the commitment of the many individuals, especially my predecessor, President Emerita Mary Sue Coleman, the future outlook of our African collaborations is exceedingly bright. Faculty from both of our continents are working together to advance democracy, the arts, public health, STEM education, environmental sustainability, and much, much more. We also know that three of the five fastest growing economies in the world are in Africa. And our intellectual investments in each other are poised for an even greater decade ahead. In service to our bright future, I'm proud to announce that the Office of the President is renewing its support for the University of uh, Michigan's African Presidential Scholars Program. <laughs> One goal of our support will be to continue the program's success in bringing African scholars to our campus. By continuing the momentum, we can work to ensure that UMAPS, as it's known, becomes a perpetual source of pride and excellence for our university, as well as a prescient investment in our shared future. UMAPS has brought now 135 early career faculty from 10 African countries to Ann Arbor since it began just 10 years ago in 2008. While here, they further their work on a research project, an academic degree, publications, grant proposals, or other relevant activities. We pair them with a faculty mentor and provide full access to all of the University of Michigan's resources. I had the wonderful opportunity to meet the most recent cohort of African presidential scholars last month at a reception at our house. Uh, the richness and diversity of the scholars and what they bring to our community in terms of their intellect, uh, the culture that they bring and represent, uh, the knowledge of the world that they bring right here to Ann Arbor is truly irreplaceable. Uh, this program represents truly an investment in our shared future. Uh, beyond the scholarship that uh, these young scholars do and what our current students and faculty learn from them, the collaborations that grow, the whole new areas of research that are begun by these visitors, it's actually an investment in world peace. It's an investment in people getting to know one another and demystifying the differences uh, that we tend to focus on and giving us the time and opportunity to live together in a way that we can see the commonalities and the shared interests very clearly. So it truly does, in a small but growing way, change the world, and I'm extremely proud of it. So no discussion of the UMAPS program would be complete without mentioning the commitment of this morning's keynote speaker. While serving as the 13th president of the University of Michigan, Mary Sue Coleman went to Ghana and South Africa. After returning and bringing back the drums, she established the African Study Center along with its key initiatives, including UMAPS. President Coleman also brought the foresight to recognize the importance of STEM education in Africa. Her support of U of M's STEM Africa initiative is both enhancing our understanding and expanding participation in scientific practice and knowledge building. Additionally, during her 12 years leading our campus, President Coleman created enduring partnerships with universities in China and Brazil and India, while also spearheading innovative initiatives that foster talent development and economic growth right here in Michigan. President Coleman, of course, is now president of the, American, of the Association of American Universities, uh, we're very thankful that she's at the helm of our most important professional organization during a transformative moment for higher education here in the United States and around the world. Under her leadership, the AAU has launched renewed efforts to emphasize and advocate for the importance of higher education for all members of society. We can appreciate her tireless work to advance public funding of research and to keep our doors open wide to talented, hardworking students and immigrants from all nations. Please help me welcome President Mary Sue Coleman. Wow. I'm 
delighted to be here. Uh, I was told to tell you that uh, we moved to this larger room because we had a request from many people to come, but I think the cold has kept a lot of people away. <laughs> so the hearty souls that are here, thank you. I, I, it's awful for us as well as is our colleagues coming from Africa, I will tell you that. The winter is never going to go away. But uh, I want to thank you, Mark, for your kind words and for your leadership. It, it is always just a great pleasure for me to return to campus and sharing the program with you, Mark, makes it all the more pleasurable. You know, I can really hardly believe that a decade has passed in the life of the African Studies Center. And this is so fabulous to see you all today. I want to join in welcoming all the scholars who are here from universities throughout Africa. And I want to thank Professor Kelly Askew for her leadership of the African Studies Center for the past 10 years. It's been remarkable. Now, I'm going to spend some time this morning sharing many of the achievements of the center, and including, as Mark said, one of my favorites, the African Presidential Scholars Program. Dr. Askew has played a key role in these successes. We do owe her a debt of gratitude for her commitment to building bridges between the University of Michigan and students and scholars throughout Africa. As president of the Association of American Universities, I represent the top 60 research universities in the country. They are a mix of public and private, from Virginia and Berkeley to Harvard and Brown. U of M was a founding member of this organization in 1900. One of the features that gives these research universities their strengths is the commitment to international collaboration. Joint degree programs study abroad opportunities, global internships, faculty and student exchanges. They embody our mission of creating and sharing knowledge. Understanding the world we serve is essential to our impact as research universities. That's why this symposium matters. It is a anniversary celebration and a rightful one at that. And Mark, it is just terrific that you're going to be funding from the President's office again into the future this important work. So much has been accomplished and I'm happy to share many of these achievements with you. The 10 year anniversary of the African Studies Center also stands as a powerful statement. We are living in an era of intolerance and prejudice when the bonds with people and nations different from ours are pilloried by the leadership across this country. It is an era when visitors of different backgrounds and histories are wrongly viewed as suspicious or dangerous. It is a time that gives us pause about the true nature of pluralism and our heritage as a nation of immigrants. The African Studies Center and all global collaborations at Michigan exist to defy this bigotry and this ignorance. They are beacons of knowledge and understanding that provide insight and inspiration for our students and our scholars. We should all support this work and hold it up as an antidote to the poisonous thinking that threatens goodwill and good learning. So let's celebrate the work of the African Studies Center. I'd like to begin by, thank you, thank you. But I'd like to begin by taking you back in time, not 10 years ago, but 12. Starting in 2006 and continuing into 2007, the International Institute surveyed our faculty to determine who was engaged in Africa where the work was based, and what the focus of that work was. The result was a 75-page inventory. It showed more than 120 faculty members engaged in an array of teaching and research and service in 40 African countries. In the north, we were researching cancer epidemiology in Algeria and carrying out archaeological investigations in Egypt. To the east, faculty were exploring forestry governance in Kenya and studying the Jelada monkey in Ethiopia. In the West, scholars were researching polio eradication in Nigeria and medical rehabilitation in Liberia. 
I learned that Michigan had a strong, strong presence in South Africa, where more than 40 faculty members were engaged in work stretching from economic development and the prevention of youth violence to archival initiatives and graduate training of black scholars. It was an impressive, even daunting overview of our work. Now, I need to pause here just a minute for our visitors and explain one notable feature of the University of Michigan. You may be asking why it was necessary to conduct such an inventory. Didn't we just know all this? Wasn't there a list somewhere? Well, no. The University of Michigan is highly decentralized, highly. This gives us wonderful academic strength, but at the same time, it can represent missed opportunities. The ongoing challenge for both faculty and administrators is to find ways to reach out across this vast organization that is the university to connect and collaborate. <clears throat> We're always looking for ways to make whole the sum of our parts and truly capitalize on Michigan's academic strengths. That is what really led to the establishment 10 years ago of the African Studies Center. We recognize the tremendous potential of bringing together all of this work, finding ways to coordinate and strengthen our teaching and research, promoting partnerships we have throughout the continent. We all know that scholarship knows no boundaries, and the University of Michigan has a rich legacy of area studies in programs that explore specific regions of our world. We have a Center for Southeast Asia Studies, the Armenian Studies Program, the Wiser Center for Europe and Eurasia, the Brazil Initiative, and more. By crossing geographic and intellectual boundaries, these centers provide an academic home for students and faculty alike, both from our university and around the globe. They allow for cross-fertilization of ideas and expertise that advance our understanding of the world around us. The African Studies Center was critical, a critical addition to these offerings. In concert with announcing the African Studies Center, we planned, made plans to visit two countries where U of M had its deepest connections, Ghana and South Africa. Ten years ago this month, I led a delegation of faculty and administrators, and we met our counterparts at nine universities in these two countries. It was a critical opportunity to share our plans, and most important, for us to listen to the aspirations and concerns of our peers in Accra, Cape Town, and elsewhere. We did not conduct this work in a vacuum. The question always asked was this, how can we, as a university, incre increase our engagement in Africa in a way that is mutually beneficial to all of us? The answer in 2008 and 10 years later is that we succeed by collaborating. So where is the African Studies Center today? It is, I believe, in a very good place. Its initiatives are healthy and productive and are what separate U of M from other African Studies programs. We have the African Heritage and Humanities Initiative, which explores how African cultures and histories are made. The African Social Research Initiative embraces what Michigan does so well in social science. Data collection and analysis are used to help explain politics, income dynamics, and the connections between gender, health, and development. The Michigan-Ethiopia Collaborative Consortium reaches into communities with patient care, research, service learning, and more. And STEM Africa promotes science, technology, engineering, and math, and, it, and, and how it can be applied to global problems. When we launched the African Studies Center, it was with an emphasis on social science and the humanities. But we knew from our inventory of faculty work that nearly one half of our scholars engaged in Africa were involved through the sciences. In addition, the addition of STEM Africa in 2009 is what helped differentiate our center from others. And here I want to thank President Emeritus Jim Duderstadt for his support of the STEM initiative. <clears throat> I know that he'll be joining us later this morning. In fact, he just walked in. And I look forward to our conversations, Jim. 
In the past 10 years, this center has provided financial support for U of M students, for internships, travel, and participation in conferences, and support of research projects. Michigan students have worked as interns in 15 different African countries, and I'm certain that they will never forget these experiences. The Center's support of faculty research has touched 35 different African nations. In what I think of as one of the most impressive statistics of the last decade, the African Studies Center can be found in 17 of Michigan's 19 schools and colleges. That demonstrates tremendous breadth that touches students in so many different ways. <clears throat> One of these many scholars is Professor Derek Peterson, a historian of East Africa, whose work includes archiving and sharing Ugandan government documents. His work, which involves students from U of M and African universities, was recognized last year with a MacArthur Foundation Fellowship or what some call a genius grant. Dr. Peterson holds degrees from the University of Minnesota and the University of Rochester and has taught here at Michigan since 2009. All three of these universities are AAU members, so it's an academic trifecta that I am very proud to share. And we see the work of our faculty in the curriculum with courses on Africa more than doubling in the past decade. That includes history of art courses about the African presence in museums, language classes such as Zulu and Swahili, nursing in Liberia, weather, space weather science in South Africa, and maternal health in Ghana. I envy so much our students and the choices that they have. All of this, though, brings me to what I consider to be the crown jewel of the African Studies Center the African Presidential Scholars Program. By no measure do I mean to diminish any of the center's many assets, but let me tell you why I admire this particular program as much as I do. When I led the U of M delegation to Africa in 2008, I met so many smart, dedicated faculty members who were overwhelmed by teaching demands, simply overwhelmed. There were so few resources available to them to help nurture their scholarly pursuits. And providing resources was something tangible that U of M could do. With this program, early career scholars from African universities come to our campus for six months to take full advantage of all that U of M has to offer. I know of only one other program at Michigan that is comparable and that is the Knight Wallace Fellows Program for Mid-Career Journalists. The idea for both journalists and African scholars is to hold open Michigan's doors wide and to say explore. Take time to read the current literature, audit a class, deepen your research, complete a journal article. The idea is to immerse yourself in the academy for the good of one's work as a scholar and a teacher. In the first year, we hosted 10 scholars from two countries, South Africa and Ghana. Today, having hosted our 10th cohort, Michigan has welcomed 135 scholars from 10 countries and 32 different universities. Let me tell you what these scholars have done. One in four has returned home to complete a PhD. I can't tell you how important that is. Only 18% of faculty at African universities hold doctoral degrees, and it's often the re for the reason that I mentioned earlier. As soon as these young scholars complete an advanced degree, they're pressed into service as faculty, as teachers or administrators. That work that they do, of course, is important, yet by limiting the education of faculty, the work of the university is limited. African universities cannot offer PhD programs without faculty with PhDs. So the African Presidential Scholars Program helps support the PhD pipeline and the full capacity of African universities. The Presidential Scholars Program makes a difference in another way. We see that time spent at Michigan helps combat the brain drain that so often threatens the professoriate 
of African institutions. The opportunities here provide a source of engagement and energy that helps alumni return home to publish research findings, submit articles, and produce other scholarly work. These alumni have published more than 200 works in the past decade. Others have been promoted to tenured positions, department chairs, and deanships. In supporting these faculty, as they engage in research, finish a paper, or publish a book, we are in turn helping their students who benefit from a better prepared, prepared professor. We want to support these scholars so that they can excel at home where they are most needed. Lastly, the African Presidential Scholars Program makes for better scholars at Michigan. Faculty here who serve as mentors gain so much from these new collaborations and partnerships with African colleagues and that new knowledge benefits our students. Our faculty do not hesitate to say, I learned a tremendous amount. Faculty in medicine, law, the social sciences, engineering, the humanities, natural sciences, all have grown professionally because of connections with scholars from Cameroon, Liberia, Tanzania, Zambia, and elsewhere. Let me give you an example and a bit of a teaser of a conversation that will take place later this morning. Avi Aviona and Annette Ogutu are professors of law. Professor Ogutu came to Michigan in the very first cohort of African presidential scholars. Her mentor was Professor Aviona because of their common bond, tax law. I don't want to put words in Professor Aviona's mouth but he did not know much about South African tax law. International law was his field of expertise, and he has written the most widely used textbook on the subject. But there's always more to learn, and South African law was fertile territory for him. <clears throat> and Professor Ogutu had all this knowledge, but not enough time to share it. These two academics came together and drew upon each other's expertise. Professor Ogutu found time to complete several journal articles while here, and all were subsequently published. Professor Aviona expanded his understanding of the intricacies of international tax law, and he incorporated the lessons of South Africa into his lectures and writing, and went to South Africa at Annette's invitation to address, a, a, to make a keynote address at a conference that she organized the symbiotic work happens again and again because of the African Presidential Scholars Program. Whether in Ann Arbor or Pretoria, we see faculty eager to participate and to make a difference, not only in the lives of their students, but in the communities that we all serve. It is just a win-win for all involved. <coughs> Let me conclude with gratitude and with a challenge. The University of Michigan has created a successful model for collaboration that is based on equity. We've had relationships throughout Africa for decades and we always strive to broaden the spirit of reciprocity that has been the hallmark of these alliances. We want to learn as much as we want to teach. I want to thank the faculty from throughout Africa who chose and who choose the University of Michigan to continue their scholarship. You are always welcome here. And thank you to the Michigan faculty who serve as mentors, enriching the work of our guests and expanding knowledge for U of M students. And thank you to the faculty, students, and leaders of the African Studies Center for, your, for the entire expanse of your work. You really do demonstrate that scholarship knows no borders and your contributions help make Michigan an exemplary place to learn and teach. We're living in interesting times. I find myself saying that more and more. <laughs> These are interesting, challenging, and sometimes discouraging times. But please join me 
in always advocating for research universities and everything they bring to our society. This includes life-changing international collaborations. There's an African proverb that says, knowledge is like a garden. If it is not cultivated, it cannot be harvested. Continue to nurture this center. Keep open your doors and you will open minds with your collective knowledge. Diverse perspectives will always make for stronger bridges connecting us as people and as nations. The differences between us, differences in perspectives and cultures should never be the source of derision or nativism. Rather, these differences give us our strength as educators, researchers, and contributing citizens of the world. Thank you for allowing me to be part of such a special celebration. Nothing would make me happier than to help celebrate the 20th anniversary of the African Studies. <laughs> So <laughs> thank you. So Kelly tells me that uh, there may be questions, and if there are, I'll be happy to try to address those questions. Or anything you'd like to ask about? President Coleman, so good to see you, Avita Fuller. I'm um, former associate director and interim director of the AC. The, the group that you took to um, Ghana and was it South Africa recently? Can you tell us some of the conclusions that, or some of the highlights of that group and some of the outcomes? <laughs> That's really exciting. Uh, well, it was it was kind of astonishing uh, the trips. I, I I have to say that. Uh, uh, the thing that I, in both places there were there were different aspects that were really interesting in Ghana. What struck me because we were really um, looking at the area of women's pre reproductive health, and what uh, particularly people in the medical school at Michigan had done over a long period of time. They'd been there for 25 years before we ever went to to Ghana, and so we were concentrating in medical schools and uh, in in talking to physicians. So I, I had this incredible experience because they told me that uh, at the medical school, because of this association with Michigan, they had started a tumor board and, and, and with people sitting around talking about cancer and how hard it was to get that started in the beginning because having breast cancer in, in Ghana was, a sh was something that people didn't talk about. And, and women were, it was a shamed thing, and they couldn't bring it forward. And so it was so hard to break the cultural barrier to bring it forward and talk. And, and uh, Lisa Newman, I think, was there, and she's a cancer person. And, and, and just to hear the, uh, the evolution of that and how it happened, and then to meet the medical students there who were these incredibly talented young people. And, and, and I, I, I sort of thought about this, and we met these wonderful, talented uh, young people at the universities in, in, in South Africa as well. And I was just recently, earlier this week, at a dinner and a, media, a talk by Malcolm Gladwell. And, and he was talking about the fact that, you know, we think talent is rare and it's precious and it's rare and it's, you know, you have to nurture. He said, talent's everywhere. It, you just, and I know this is something that Mark Slissel has said so much, which I think is so powerful. Talent is everywhere. Opportunity is not everywhere. And, and think about what we could unleash for the world if we had more opportunity for that talent. And I think those experiences in, in Africa really brought that home to me and how wonderful it was the young people had the opportunity to go to university and to get those experiences because, it, you know, it's, it's just transformative. So it was it, it, very exciting to be there in a way that I didn't expect. I should have, but I didn't. So I learned something. <laughs> Question over here. Derek. I'm Derek 
I'm Derek Peterson. I, I, I wouldn't be here if you hadn't founded the African Studies Center in 2008. It's, <laughs> okay. It was your initiative that mm -hmm. created the kind of momentum around African mm -hmm. studies that brought many of us here in the late 2000s mm -hmm. and 2010s. And so, I mean, look, what's interesting for me as a historian about the founding of the center in 2008 is that it was distinctly belated. That is, most African Studies Centers yeah. across the United States were founded in the 60s in the mm -hmm. context of a Cold War dynamic that looked to area studies in universities as a way of equipping yeah. cold warriors against the threats abroad. So teaching world languages was a way of reinforcing America's ability to be secure. The dynamics here were quite different because we didn't have an African Studies Center. We had CAS, as it then was, now a department, uh, but not a center of the kind that we have now. So I, I wonder, what was the kind of conjuncture of things that made it possible for this kind of yeah. late creation of a center here. Could you pull, draw back the curtain for us a bit and help us see why in 2008 it was possible for this to happen at this institution? Well, um, you know, one of the things that, that I really, when I'd been here a few years uh, at Michigan, that I, I was struck by the fact that while there were many individual faculty working all over the world, I mean, Michigan faculty are going to going to be working everywhere, but there weren't very many sort of concerted bringing together institutional imprimatur uh, of these things. And, and I, I, can't, I can't say why that didn't happen, but I was very interested in making it happen. And when we, and I'd asked the uh, International Center to do this inventory of where faculty were, that is, what were the concentrations. And, and I also wanted Michigan to do something a little bit different. I mean, I understand there were lots of African centers at other universities, but I thought Michigan could bring something different to the table. Um, I hope we have. I, I mean, I, I think it was that possibility. So I was so struck by, by the opportunity in Africa. I thought this is, a, this is an area that, that, that would represent something that would bring information and experiences to our students that would, were going to be different and, and that we could do something by bringing Mi Michigan's breadth of scholarship there. And, and I guess it only deepened in making the trip and going. Uh, but, you know, I, I went to Brazil as well, which was another sort of very interesting experience to go to Brazil. And then we, we've done things in China, uh, but very specific, uh, very targeted in, in specific academic areas. And I, I, I guess... I, I, it was just, I, was, I just thought I was fascinated by it, and I was surrounded by people who wanted to get involved. I mean, Lester Montz was critical. Uh, Lester's here, and I think he kept advocating for Africa, and he was right. Uh, so I, I don't know how to put it. It was the combination of having the talent around me, the people that I talked to, and were trying to convince me to do things. And I said, hey, you know, this looks interesting, and, and it just exceeded all my expectations. Thank you so much. That's it? Okay, great. Thank you. I'm going to turn over now to James Holloway, our, our Vice Provost for Global Engagement, who's going to moderate the next session. of Engineering Diversity Committee meeting. <laughs> switch microphones and so on, but the fact is that we've arranged so many speakers for this symposium that there are no microphones left at the University of Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> so it gives me great pleasure.
great pleasure to introduce um, two biochemists, a neuroscientist, a zoologist, uh, a nuclear engineer, and a chemical engineer. <laughs> Uh, and so it really struck me, we, uh, we've brought together a panel of current and, and previous university presidents from both the University of Michigan and Africa. And we really wanted to bring this panel together in part to have, to have a conversation where we get to hear from university <coughs> leadership about the challenges that they face, the opportunities they have, the, the successes that they've had, and to hear about the commonalities between universities and university opportunities between the continent and the United States. And because this is really a, a place in which usually we find more in common than we find different. And I was struck by this yesterday when uh, uh, one of our panel, uh, Ophelia Weeks, was talking to me about, you know, one of the things, the problems I have to deal with that you don't is I have students in my office demanding that I fire people. <laughs> <laughs> Very soon, Mark, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so Mark also reminded me this morning that within two months of his taking the presidency, he had, he had students on his lawn of his house at midnight telling him how to be fired. <laughs> and so this is really an area of So it gives me great pleasure to introduce the panel. Uh, and I'm just going to do very short introductions. So you have full bios in your. Uh, uh, in your program. So first we have uh, James Duderstadt, uh, President Emeritus of the University of Michigan. Uh, we have uh, Ophelia Weeks, uh, President of the University of Liberia. I should say, by the way, Jim is the nuclear engineer. Ophelia is the neuroscientist. Uh, Mark Schlissel, the 14th President and current President of the University of Michigan, a biochemist and, a, and an MD. Um, Emmett Dennis, who is the immediate past President of the University of Liberia and a zoologist. Uh, Mary Sue Coleman, who you've just met, 13th president of the University of Michigan and another biochemist. And then um, uh, uh, Uke uh, Chinje Mello from the University of Nagondarere, uh, who is a chemical engineer. Uh, and so we seem to be really uh, focused on the, uh, the STEM piece here, but in fact each of these leaders has led and developed a comprehensive university that touches all the different fields of, uh, uh, of human intellect and, and human capacity. And so I'm going to start by asking the panel questions about successes that they've had during their time as presidents in any areas of uh, 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 any areas uh, that universities touch on, research, teaching, um, outreach, social inclusivity, whatever it may be. And I'm going to start by putting Mark uh, on the, uh, it's, it's always good to do to your boss, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm putting Mark on the, on the hot seat. And, Look, the and home say, team goes in the bottom half. <laughs> But Mark, so uh, tell us about uh, what do you think are some important successes that we've had here at the University of Michigan over the last few years? Sure, so I, I kind of like talking with the drums. That's pretty clumsy. Cool. I think I'm going to have drums at all my talks from now on. We're going to do it at the end, so it's Okay, good. good. Uh, so I think if I had to pick on something, uh, uh, both a, a challenge and then a, an early success I think we've had, you know, we're challenged by making sure that the educational opportunities we provide here are accessible and affordable to all the people that we serve. Uh, so, the, you know, the state of Michigan has gone through economic ups and downs. Uh, the overall funding for the university has, in effect, diminished through the decades, not increased. Uh, and that makes it a big challenge to make sure that uh, higher education in Michigan and really in the United States isn't just another privilege for the wealthy. Uh, so uh, one of the things I'm particularly proud of is we launched a, a new uh, program to promote uh, socioeconomic diversity on the campus. It's called the Go Blue Guarantee. And that's really just a fancy name for a financial aid program. Um, the uh, average family income of our current in-state students uh, is about $150,000 a year. The average family income in the state of Michigan is only $65,000 a year. Uh, only about 15% of our students are at or below this median income. So what we did is we've launched a financial aid program, this Go Blue Guarantee, that says to the students from the state of Michigan, uh, if um, you come from a family at or below this median income uh, and you get accepted to the university, we guarantee you free tuition for four years plus whatever other financial aid your individual circumstance qualifies for. 
And it turns out something that the marketing folks told me, you know, they, we didn't have to study, but of course we did. The word free is very powerful. Uh, and although we haven't announced numbers for this year, there's a big increase in the number of applicants and the economic diversity of the applicants to our university. Uh, and as you know, Mary Sue quoted, uh, one of the things uh, that certainly seems true to me from my life as an educator uh, is that talent really is everywhere in society and we're selling ourselves short by not identifying that talent in all different parts of our uh, society and educating them. Everybody loses when you don't educate a talented person. That person doesn't have uh, as rich and fulfilling a life and their contributions to society uh, aren't at the level that they could be. And then uh, all of us end up paying the price of this undereducated fellow uh, citizen. Uh, so this Global Guarantee is actually what I'm most proud of and optimistic about at the university. Thanks, Mark. So Emmett, um, Mark talked a little bit about the importance of access to education. You, over the last many years, have uh, undertaken what is a truly a, a, a huge project to take the University of Liberia out of a time of civil war. Uh, and grow it as an institution and provide that access for the people of Liberia. I wonder if any, uh, any of uh, what Mark was talking about resonates and, and how you've uh, managed to grow the university over these last years. Absolutely. Uh, you know, when you're dealing with a, uh, a post-conflict university, you're overwhelmed with uh, challenges, so it's very difficult to to see what you might perceive as success. But if I may do that, uh, it was very clear to me uh, that the flight of a talented faculty was the most uh, limiting factor at the, the university. And it became very clear to me that uh, without collaborative efforts, it would be even more difficult to return to the quality of university that you wanted to bring up. So one major success is the admission of the University of Liberia into the UMAPS program. And through this program, we had 20 of our faculty. This was a little bit different from uh, talented young faculty coming, but this time we did what we call retooling of the faculty that were left at the university because many uh, left. And so when I got the word that we could send our faculty for retooling, this was like Christmas. Christmas present, and the evolution of this program. Shortly after that, with Rutgers University, University of Michigan, we got a grant to uh, develop our engineering program at the University of Liberia. So we switched from retooling into young faculty coming for pairing with uh, University of Michigan faculty. And it is through this collaborative effort that we were able to bring the, the qualitative profile of the University of Liberia uh, up. And we follow very closely the poverty reduction strategy of the country in terms of the pursuit of disciplines that will benefit the country. Thank you. I think we heard earlier from, from both Mary Sue and Derek the importance of the, the mutual benefit. And so as we have worked with those faculty from the University of Liberia, there's benefit to faculty here. Derek has, has talked in other venues about the importance of UMAP scholars to his work in Uganda. And so as that benefits you, it benefits us as well. I was um, curious as, uh, when Mark spoke about, again, about access, um, Jim, I'm thinking back to when you were president in the 1990s, and there's a real sense of a, of a shift in what it means to be a public university that's really we can trace back to, to that time and earlier, the change in state funding, the change in our focus on undergraduate education. I think you might reflect a little bit on those times. Actually, what I'd like to do is think a little bit broader, uh, because it was in the 1980s 
and then into the 1990s that uh, the University of Michigan had the opportunity of working with uh, IBM to build the Internet. Uh, we initially built it as a government uh, network, uh, but by the early 1990s, uh, when the World Wide Web appeared, industry, uh, commercial in, uh, side of the uh, business, uh, discovered it, and we spun it off. And uh, it, it evolved very rapidly, uh, the technology evolving at a rate of 100 to 1,000 times a year. We also turned out students that had an impact on that. One of them was Larry Page, who graduated from this university during the late 1990s and created a company that you may know of called Google. Uh, now today, we look at that impact uh, with some cynicism, uh, things like alt-truth and Trumpism and populism and so forth that are using this technology through social networks. But I'd like to relate it just for a moment to the challenge uh, faced by Africa. Uh, demographers suggest that, that the world's population will continue to increase uh, over the next several decades, but not so much in the developed economies, which are aging and, and growth is limited. Most of the growth will occur in Africa. Uh, with a population of 1.2 billion a day, it will be over 2.4 billion by the turn of the century which means there will be billions of citizens that are going to need the kind of skills to work in a world in which technology is changing things very rapidly. Uh, this technology which we look at today is very threatening may be the key to providing the mass kind of education and in fact the only way to provide the education that will serve that kind of a population. And so I come back to challenge institutions like Michigan and the developed economy as to how they tame the bad side of this activity and use it as an incredible resource to provide learning opportunities to the parts of the world that desperately will be needing. I'm, I'm curious on the panel if any of you have seen successes of this kind of online technologically mediated uh, educational uh, uh, program uh, either in Africa or in, in other places. A lawyer should never ask a question when he doesn't know the, what the answer will be. Well, I think it's going to happen. I, you know, I, I, I think we, what we have now is is more of a uh, we're experimenting. A lot of people are experimenting. There are a lot of experiments going on. You know, the software is not as good as it will get. The program is not as good. It will get there, and 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 and, and so I think we while, while we. We are skeptical about people who say everything's going to go online and there's going to be no other kind. I mean, that's silly. Uh, but, but it will happen, and it, will, and it needs to happen, Jim, in areas of the world that don't have the kind of access that we have. It must happen. And, and, and we can help, and our brilliant faculty should be figuring out how to do this and help. So I, I'm confident that we're going to get there. I think there's an interesting place here as well when you think about the ability of um, – countries in Africa to leapfrog us in various ways. And we heard some about this yesterday, where in fact in certain kinds of telecommunications, and in particular in financial transactions on cell phones, um, there are whole systems in both Africa and Kenya and in India that have really leapfrogged the West uh, and, and the United States. And I think we may in fact have the opportunity to create that uh, uh, here as well. Um, Ufi, you had uh, a great STEM uh, event uh, in Cameroon uh, just uh, uh, last summer. I wonder if you'd like to tell us about that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, actually, I was here for the STEM tree. That was in uh, April 2014. And uh, then uh, I was with a colleague, uh, Charles Owono, and we were very impressed. And we felt... Uh, STEM force should take place in Cameroon, and uh, it did take place. Uh, it was end of May, early June 2017, and uh, I was very grateful that uh, AFC decided that STEM force should take place in Cameroon, and uh, it was taken at a very high scale. Actually, it was done under the auspices of the head of state, President Paul B. And uh, it was co-chaired by two ministers, Minister Fermin Dongo, whom I remember in 2014 in this room, he was part of the video conference, the Minister of Higher Education, as well as Madeleine Chuente. 
the minister in charge of research and innovation. You know, they co-chaired this event, which was heavily attended, you know, thanks to uh, University of Michigan, actually, when uh, Sue was talking about uh, the successes and the difference of uh, ASC, of the University of Michigan, she made mention of uh, the STEM factor of it. And we know, of course, in Africa, we need science, technology, engineering, and maths more than anything else, you know, because we need to develop the economy, we need to develop skills. You know, so this was taken at a very high level in, the, in Cameroon. Actually, even the Prime Minister received some of the, the participants as well as the ministers. And uh, we're really looking forward to add my presence here. I think I'll look at it as a continuity, you know, of business that was not finished. You know, because uh, under normal circumstances, I should be in Cameroon. We are um, very involved in politics. We have Senate elections, which would be on the 25th. But given the importance of this event, I felt I should come, especially come and sit on this uh, presidential panel and make sure University of Michigan knows that the government of Cameroon is looking forward to working STEM-related activities in Cameroon and looking at the University of Michigan as the gateway, the entrance to the United States of America. You know, so it's something that the government is very passionate about, and I'm really hoping that... Uh, we could really develop strength. I was telling Sue that if maybe in 2008, if uh, there were already a good number of faculties in Cameroon, I'm sure she would have visited Cameroon and would have been very involved. <laughs> <laughs> so please, you know, I mean, we look really looking forward to to get. And of course, today I'm the in when we finished in uh, June 2017, I was not the president of my university. I don't know. I guess maybe the STEM conference was. I don't know. One never knows how those things happen. But on the 27th of June, I was appointed by the head of state to head the University of Ngaoundiri. And, uh, well, it's one of the universities very strategically placed. We have in the Adamawa region, because we have eight state universities, but uh, the University of Ngaoundiri and ten regions. And the objective is for a region, a university per region. But, uh, well, we've not been able to meet up with all of that. And the University of Ngaoundiri is the only university that covers three regions. Recently, we have a school of, I mean, we have 12 faculties and schools. And uh, recently, 2018, we had the School of Medicine and the School of Higher Teachers Training that were added to a lot of faculties and universities. So the strategic position of the University of Gaoundé, where, as I said, on the, we have Nigeria in the Adamawa region. On the other side, we have a part of Chad and part of uh, Central African Republic. Within the country, we have six or no, five other regions bordering the University of Gaudry. So the strategic position is very good for, I mean, the, the, the partnership with the University of Michigan. You know, I'm inviting... You're a good salesperson. <laughs> oh, oh my. <laughs> We've got to do that because, as I said, you know, I really had to be here. And I had to cut across, you know, so many things that should have been keeping me in Cameroon. But I said, no, I must come for, to continue the business. And I'm very grateful to be on this uh, panel with uh, the Emeritus uh, Presidents as, and the current Presidents of, the, of Liberia and the University of Michigan. And as I said, I'm opening an invitation to Mark. I know my the name too, I'm among those who find it. I, I, I hope I'm not probably wrongly seen Am I right? Perfect. Oh, great. Okay, so I'm opening an invitation <laughs> to you and of course uh, to all those who are in Cameroon. I see a good number of them here who are in Cameroon. I guess they know how strategic Cameroon is. They saw the welcome, the enthusiasm. Actually, even in the last day of the panel, all eight universities were present to present some of the problems which they have, the challenges which we have. And uh, from the discussions, we realized the University of Michigan is very, very well pleased to help us. And uh, even in the University of uh, Boundary, as I took over, uh, I know Mark advised me when he took over, you needed a period of studying the environment. I studied and maybe my period was very short, but I'm trying to put up a program which has been approved by the board already. I, it's called the University of Gandhi Innovation Center of Excellence because in the region we have a very big problem. When I took over office, the minister sent me to visit all the, faculty, the, the, um, the enterprises that have been shut down. So, I mean, one of the big challenges I listened to, to Jim just talking about, I mean, university and enterprises, 
So when you don't have enterprises, it becomes a very big challenge on education, on research, you know, because you need that collaboration to be able to solve the local problems. So this uh, center of innovation I've put is to see how we interact with the socio-professional uh, world. And of course, I'm very pleased that we even put a funding system and they're willing, you know, we call it University of Gondoli Venture Capital Fund. It's just to get seed money to do startups and incubators. I mean, financing is a very big challenge, you know, in Cameroon, but with these sort of structures we've put on, we're hoping, you know, that we could be able to raise funds from within and without to be able to build the capacity. I mean, it's a university of about 25 years old. Uh, one of the major technological structures, uh, universities in Cameroon, a lot has been developed, but it stays within the university. So with some of these projects, we're hoping to take it out of the university and encourage uh, partnerships. So thank you, and I think this is certainly another common theme we see at universities across the world really is governments looking to universities as engines of economic growth and development. Uh, and, and we have a lot to learn from each other about how to do that well. Um, uh, so Ophelia, so you've started as the president of the University of Liberia very recently. <laughs> Uh, and I wonder, what's next? What's, uh, what do you hope for? Well, first, I'd like to uh, thank the University of Michigan for all that they continue to do um, to assist us and to share possibilities. Um, we have a lot in common here. I, uh, I'm the 14th president of the University of Liberia. Lucky number. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we have uh, an outgoing a male 13th president turning over to a 14th female president and a 13th female president to turn over to a 14th. Um, uh, Ufe, uh, we were in Cameroon together. Um, at the time, neither of us were president of the university, of a university, and here we are as presidents of, uh, of the university. Um, University of Michigan has uh, Dr. Elaine Cotto, I think is her name. She, uh, there she is. Ah, there. And uh, a group of graduate students and uh, undergraduate students came to the University of Liberia when I served as dean for the College of Science and Technology. And they helped our female engineering students uh, organize and develop um, the uh, Female Student Engineering Society or Association. And that has gone a long way uh, in getting the female students to have confidence in themselves and to go out into the community, into their communities, to assist other female students and to encourage them to consider science as a possible choice. Um, it's not a trivial thing that you've done. It's exceedingly important and it is go uh, ongoing. I've seen those young ladies gain confidence that they did not have before um, and initiate programs that they probably would not have. And what I see as this kind of relationship that we have here is the opportunity to share possibilities and to also realize these possibilities. Um, there are, the University of Liberia has a lot of challenges. Um, I, you know, Dr. Dennis and I were talking about this and, and uh, the question is, where do you start when you think about uh, challenges? But one of the, the, the good things, and it may seem trivial here, but one of the very important things that, it, that, that um, has happened at the University of Liberia is that we have the uh, possibility of automating our registration process at the university. It may seem trivial here, but this has been a Waterloo at the University of Liberia for the last maybe, I don't know, 
<laughs> and it's uh, been the uh, the uh, genesis of student unrest, um, student demonstrations, um, prolonged and changed academic calendar. People ask, what's your academic calendar? We can't say because it gets extended because the students feel that the university is the reason why they can't, they don't register in time. And so registration needs to extend the entire semester. Um, and the university needs to give them time to do that. So it's something that our current president has dedicated uh, to making happen and part of the 150 day deliverables for, uh, to the nation. And so we look forward to that problem being no longer a problem um, as we move forward. Thanks. So really one of the themes in, in, a, in a gathering like this is international collaborations and, and Mary Sue talked about this quite a bit. But I'm curious from, from any on the panel, what do you see as the reasons that universities should collaborate internationally? What are, the, what are the drivers, what are the, the benefits that, that come from that kind of, of engagement? Mark, you want to dive in? Uh, you know, this is you know, like preaching to the choir, but <laughs> of course, um, people from different parts of the world uh, identify problems differently from one another. Uh, they bring different perspectives on challenges together uh, to uh, groups. Uh, they provide resources for one another that are uh, region of the world specific. Um, and uh, all of those things help us do our scholarship at, at a higher level. Uh, I think if one had to characterize uh, what's happening globally in this century is that the world is becoming smaller you know, through modes of communication and modes of travel. Uh, things that happen in Africa that in previous centuries we wouldn't have heard about in America for weeks, if not longer. We now see and feel and experience in real time. Diseases spread globally, but also opportunities spread globally. Um, we're collaborators and competitors now with every country in the world. Uh, so the extent to which we can work together uh, lifts up the um, uh, economic and personal futures of people who are interdependent I tried to say in my opening comments, I think uh, cooperation amongst universities, especially in settings where politicians don't really know how to cooperate, uh, uh, makes the world a safer place. You know, my heart sank when the president of my country was so insulting to many countries around the world. And through our relationships with universities in Africa and elsewhere, uh, we had the face-to-face -face way to tell people this isn't how Americans think about our, our friends around the globe. So uh, it really does stabilize the world in addition to promoting a, a more uh, shared and positive economic future. Thank you. Emmett, I'm curious so, uh, your thoughts on this and, and what kinds of uh, uh, challenges and, and global challenges are universities best um, positioned to engage with through international collaboration? Uh, I think one particular area would be uh, food security. And we haven't done such a good job of, uh, of uh, alleviating poverty. And that collaboration between universities, I think, would be a, do a better job than the industries themselves. The uh, other area that I I think is extremely important, the creation of a reciprocal cultural competence. And the more we understand each other, the better we can uh, alleviate the possibilities of our conflict in the, in, in the world. Uh, I think one of the things universities can do together is from my perspective, if we look at our, our political system, our economic systems, uh, capitalism, socialism, communism, from my perspective, it seems that none of these is actually satisfying the distribution of the planet's 
wealth in an equitable manner. And since the university is a place of research, I'm wondering how can we look at this economic system and create a better system that the, the, that the wealth of the earth can be shared uh, much better because none of them are doing it at this point. And I think it's only within the, the research confines of the university that, that, that this can be done. So thank you, Emmett. Uh, one more? Just one, oh, one more. I think and it's what, what Ebola has done. Ebola has actually demonstrated the interdependence of, 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 of the world. And now is the time when universities are better able to research the management, management of, of disease, including the production of uh, chemotherapeutic agents and vaccines. I think that's best done at universities. Thank you. And in the, the last words, I'd like to thank our panel. As the drums play, we're going to move from this venue back to the uh, assembly hall through the doors here. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh